<laughs> yeah, I was on the parkway. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Super. My name is Brian Medina. I'm an alumni, past DFW SEM president. It's great to see the state of search continue to be a great resource for uh, digital marketers uh, throughout the country. And we're excited to have Kelly speak for you uh, today. She's a legacy in this space. She's been uh, history of speaking at PubCon, um, other various conferences. Uh, she's the VP of Global Strategic Partnerships at UberRail, and so she's going to tell you a little bit more about her and what's kind of going on right now in this in the space. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks so much, Brian. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm pretty loud to begin with, so it's nice to meet you all. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, welcome to Dallas, Fort Worth it, uh, as I like to call it, aka Richardson. Um, I hope everyone got in okay. I know I had some struggles at the airport. So what I'm going to talk about today is shift happening in our local search ecosystem, the ways that SMBs, mid-market, and enterprise businesses have really had to adapt to the current state of being and how it's only been a couple of years. It's only been two years, two and a half years, really, post-COVID, but it kind of seems like 84 years <laughs> or 10 years uh, if you look at it in the uh, level of advancements that have gone on. And a lot of these businesses have had to think very critically on how to future-proof their businesses, how to adapt to the change, and how to thrive in this new environment. So you'll see here, the picture on the left is the Mall of America, and the picture on the right is the Mall of Berlin. The company that I work for, Uberall, is actually headquartered in Berlin. Um, we got acquired. I actually worked for this little Dutch company called Navabs about six years ago, and the Dutch are known for mapping and shipbuilding. When we got acquired by Uberall, they used us for parts, and they we were all aqua hires, so they, they pulled us in, and we all started running different parts of the business. Um, that was a, a big change and a big disruption for our little ecosystem. And what these pictures really resemble or uh, show is the rise of superstar, super stores and shopping malls have really disrupted the way that small businesses and other brick and mortars have been thriving in the ecosystem. And they really have to create new ways to show up and be more convenient for um, customers to find them. So uh, with this, they've really been challenged by the new concepts from drive through dining to mail order catalogs. And with every new concept, analysts and econo economists um, predicted the fall of brick and mortar. But these consumers said not so quick. They're going to be the ones to really dictate this. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry. Weird. Sorry, this isn't my first time speaking. It's just <laughs> uh, <laughs> perfect. So I think many of us are of the generation where we can remember that age-old movie, You've Got Mail. Uh, it was a romantic comedy for most people. But for us, marketers, SEOs, others, uh, it's really been a looking glass into the economy of the 90s. So it was a time where big brands challenged SMBs. And they could provide better prices, and in many cases, even better quality, and an overall better experience in store and in general. We've seen an adoption in the last decades in the way that we shop. So in the early 2000s, there was the internet, smartphones, the emergence of e-commerce, for instance, and all of these things took off running. We like choice, we like convenience, um, we liked accessibility, things at our fingertips, the ability to compare offline to online, uh, pricing, and hear other people's experiences, right? 72% of people are going to trust a review from a perfect stranger. Many parts of our customer journey actually moved from offline to online during this time. And once again, location-based businesses had to adapt, and they did. It's a really convoluted ecosystem out there. It was born to support the location-based business, uh, off-site SEO. And there's been more of a transition into a digital first consumer journey. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit more today is the hybrid CX imperative. And it's really with the acceleration that's happened in the past two years, it feels like, 10 to 20 years, and in many ways, the global pandemic was a catalyst to this. Um, what we saw as an industry and what we've witnessed is really uh, in the last, it was uh, about uh, evolution over the last decade in the last few years. So 
we've been creating connected experiences, hybrid experiences for our customers, and about 74% of consumers can buy in online and offline channels when they want to buy something, and 59% of people always or usually research purchases online. That's true even when the purchase happens in a store. And nine out of 10 mobile searches end in an action, whether it's a call, click, driving directions being generated to that brick and mortar location. So with this connected experience, it's been a weird time, you know, nine hours a day of virtual calls. This isn't an environment that's conducive to, um, you know, a healthy way of meeting and engaging. And I think we've become a consumer first uh, ecosystem where when we shop, we want it and we want it now. So the pandemic really hit a hard reset button. And for many businesses, we saw creative ways that our clients have emerged and transcended this. Uh, with eating, I was in New York recently and we talk a lot about near me search. I was in New York recently. I scouted this diner. I wanted New York diner food really bad. How many people in here like diners? Good choices. <laughs> um, so I researched the restaurant before I went to it. It was about four blocks from my hotel. It was early in the morning. It was kind of cold. And the reviews were great. They were phenomenal about this diner. So as I'm walking, I'm looking, and I'm seeing all these other diners and restaurants that I could choose above this one that I've already looked at that's highly rated, and chose against it because the validation was there. These were This was a great diner to eat at. And I was thoroughly impressed when I was there and left a review myself. So it just goes to show that trust over reviews is, is top of the line. Some of our clients too, like Tesla, they invent services nobody's ever offered. Um, they fix tires and solve problems. And it makes one forget to look for the best deal. So typically, when vehicles' lives are over, about 85% of the time, um, before heading to the junkyard, their tires weren't changed. It's, it's sort of a waste of space and having the feature of a replacement tire in the vehicle. It takes up all of that time and space and energy. So to Tesla, this didn't make sense to include a spare tire in the vehicles that they're taking off the factory line because it's only needed about 15% of the time of the life of that vehicle. In place of a spare tire, there's something called a T- PMS sensor, this informs the driver when their tire pressure is low. It gives them enough time to, to actually go to a service center or call a Tesla technician to come out and change the tire. Now, uh, it decreases the risk of getting flat tires if it can sense that there is a nail in the tire, for instance. So this is what we call like a rapid response. They've solved a problem. Now, the funny thing about this is it costs $230 to repair one Tesla tire. And it's a $55 installation fee for them to go through and balance that tire out and balance the vehicle out on site. And they have a device that does that when they come out to you. So super convenient, right? They're making a killing off of this by charging $230 plus $55. At the end of the day, if I'm a Tesla owner, they're bringing the experience to me and doing it on site. And it's a convenience fee that I'm willing to pay. I don't have a Tesla. I have a Hyundai. But... I would be willing to pay that to not have to go to a service center, for instance. So during COVID, it was all about convenience and updates. And even after COVID, we noticed that. So we needed to educate these small businesses on really how to capture more customers on an ongoing basis and deliver the best customer experience that they could possibly give. That's really what differentiated them from the winners and losers. And uh, for instance, we had a lot of partners that catered to hair service clients, hairdressers, beauticians, uh, barbers. What they did was they got smart about how they're going to cater to their clientele. They couldn't actually legally service clients at their place of business. But what they ended up doing was creating custom mixed hair coloring kits and walking their clients through it, sending that kit by mail to the client, dropping it off, walking them through a virtual instance where they're showing them a couple of things. One how to apply the dye themselves, two, that it really sucks to do that. <laughs> and the moment you can, you're going to want to get back to that hairdresser to do it for you. Um, so walking the customers through the process, but reiterating how difficult it was. And there was really this massive pivot 
where customer experience in the world was key. So serving information up on a silver platter to customers, making things more findable and convenient. How many people in here use Google business profile questions and answers by a show of hands? Perfect. Creating those FAQs for the small business all the way up to the multi-location level is key. Um, making sure that customers have questions answered are really going to cut back on customer service inquiries, calls to that business, where the calls are going to be more lead generation driving business to that location. What we've also seen post-COVID is a massive emergence in voice search. So we actually conducted a voice search readiness report with a sample of about 100,000 businesses globally, major metros, uh, rural areas, all of that, uh, anything from a small business to a big brand. And what we found was there's six major components of a location's data that's typically missing or not optimized for a voice search. And that's your traditional NAP, your name, address, phone number, your website, your hours of operation, and your business description. And what we found is that 44% of all businesses are prepared for voice search readiness uh, or, or have a, a good voice search readiness score. Um, what I'm going to tell you is the tips and tricks that you can use to optimize for voice search. So one, attributes, right? Making sure all of those components that I mentioned are filled out uh, in a robust manner. And then with that, um, there's 33 million connected devices for voice search in North America alone. And this is a massive opportunity. That stats from 2018. It hasn't been updated since. So there's got to be a massive influx of even more connected devices or voice search devices. How many people in here use a voice search device on a regular basis? Show of hands. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so there's sort of the traditional voice search ecosystem. That's Siri. That's getting pushed to by Apple Maps. You have Microsoft Cortana, which is being pushed to by Bing. You have Alexa, which you can get to directly, or you can use Yelp, I hate to say it, to push to them. And um, then we've also got Samsung's Bixby solution, which gets pushed to by here or Foursquare. Foursquare acquired Factual, December of 2020. So it's this convoluted ecosystem that um, makes up that voice search journey. And then you have Google Assistant and Google Home, which get pushed to by Google. So you may think that's the traditional ecosystem. All you have to worry about is that. But there's 37 other places that you need to think about. So there are anything from search engines, apps, directories, social sites. All of those things validate the entire voice search experience. The reason why voice search is so important is with traditional search, when we're on a desktop or a laptop, there's 10 search results that are returned to you. For mobile search, there is uh, actually three search results returned to you. With voice search, we call it position zero. So it means there's one search result returned to you. My mom is a small massage therapy practice out of home. She's been there for 10 years. She outranks a massage envy that's 350 feet away from her. Now, I'm her daughter. Like, she's very fortunate as far as marketing is concerned. But she outranks them on voice search, and she wins every time. Um, so a lot of what she's doing is covered here. Just covering, too, uh, Ulta Beauty is a client. This is our CEO <laughs> with their, um, their Glam Lab app on his face. So Ulta Beauty realized it's really easy to figure out makeup colors from afar in a virtual instance, making it easier for consumers to buy certain shades of makeup um, tailored to their features. And with this, it's a virtual try-on experience. So they place QR codes through their retail stores to enable customers to try on about 10,000 products overall. And it's just the goes to show the magic of AR on mobile devices. So with our highly fragmented uh, hybrid customer online to offline journey, technology has really become an important companion overall to bridge the gap between online and offline businesses. And this shows some of the traditional businesses were able to adopt some of the best practices and really push through on e-commerce business. 
So the slide deck will be available later too, right? Yeah, okay, perfect. So this sort of gives you a how-to guide, um, the usability, what makes a great user experience overall. And um, consumer behavior now reflects the hybrid customer journey. I know I've said that a lot today. It's sort of a, a buzzword that's out there. But when we talk about the different touch points to best suit their needs and preferences in the moment, when I'm a consumer, I'm doing a demand-driven search. I'm searching with intent. I want it now. I want to go find the best solution for me, the best price. And the thing about it is differentiating the customer experience is always key here. Um, and when we think about what's needed to equip those local businesses to compete in the new current reality, the biggest question is how can we help them be competitive in the experience that they offer to potential customers? So it's crucial that it's not just about online versus offline, but consumers do not choose a specific channel, for example, um, e-commerce, right? For the sake of it, they choose it for the experience that it offers. And to keep that in mind, when you're thinking about how to better help the businesses that you cater to. And yes, online stores do use technology to create customer experiences, but what else should they do right? They're online stores, so let's not forget they're actually a hybrid themselves. Um, this is the Forrester study that I mentioned a little bit earlier. When we're looking for ways to help our partners and clients navigate in this new world, we actually put together extensive research while Forrester did by using our data. But uh, what we found was basically uh, organizations prioritizing initiatives that support the hybrid CX journey uh, are paramount, and about 70% of companies lack confidence in their ability to deliver that hybrid CX. Uh, there's challenges with data security 67% of the time, team, al team alignment 66% of the time, and legacy technology, 64% of the time, those are the biggest hurdles that they have to get over. I can send you this study too uh, if you want to message me. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and I'll also, if anyone wants to come up afterwards, I'll give them a business card. When we also talk about uh, online businesses, there's very large multi-location brands, right? It's this is more for SMBs looking to create a competitive advantage to outrank or to compete effectively with those local to global brands. And in the context of local businesses, local search, for example, and a business's ability to show up when people search for it nearby based on proximity, based on intent, um, it's basic requirement to make the customer experience happen in the first place. So this also shows us how crucial it is for businesses to think from their customer's perspective, pretty much a no-brainer. Uh, in reality, businesses still focus on their revenue a lot, and for good reason. It's their top goal. The problem is, though, they, they lose the customer centricity. Uh, so some important takeaways. It's not just about online versus offline, but about how to compete on experience. And secondly, using digital technology to enhance customer experience is not monopolized by online businesses or the very large multi-location chains, but a very relevant measure to compete on experience for small local businesses as well. So does anyone have any questions for me? Okay. Well, great. <laughs> I've got I think, 10 more minutes. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. That was. Questions for Kelly. We got her here. She, she knows the stuff. Let's. Why don't you yeah, expand a little bit on that?
Is this better? Yeah, so my mom's business, um, she actually is a small to medium-sized business. She's a out-of-home massage therapist, I mentioned earlier. She really caters to the geriatric crowd, um, folks that have had cancer, so an oncology crowd, um, and clients that like Swedish massage. So basically within Google Q&A, as the owner of the Google business profile page or an admin on the page, you can ask yourself questions. So basically through that page, we've asked a ton of questions. Like, do you offer deep tissue massage? Yes, I offer deep tissue massage, myofascial release, all of these different search terms. And it doesn't help her to rank locally, but it makes it convenient for her customers to see and know all the different services that she provides. Also through um, Google's content uh, creation platform, you can actually, in the GBP, create like a menu of services that we've embedded on her uh, website. So it makes it really, it, it makes it really easy for people to access that information, no pricing if they're shopping around, and um, also just optimizing for her location with a ton of off-site SEO as well as on-site, but making sure that she's found and optimize in a very custom way. Her logo is embedded on different map results and things like that. So uh, it's also catering to in-car navigation systems and GPS and um, you know, on all of the main places that people are searching for. Like Baidu, for instance, is a directory that's mostly popular in APAC, but we leverage it because a lot of folks that are now in North America are still using the app or the search engine to search. And this is a great way to target um, a, a market that is actively searching for these businesses too, but oftentimes is underserved in the North American market. Any other questions? Hey. Again, again about your mom. <laughs> is she showing a physical location? Yes, okay. yes, and, and her address. Uh, Service-based business, basically, yeah. But do, do, any tips on that? do they um, do they actually serve people at their location, though? No. Okay. Uh, I'll give you my email address. We actually have three Google business uh, profile or three Google product experts on our team, so they're colleagues of Google and colleagues of ours, so they can help you troubleshoot that. I'm no expert there. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, it sounds like you work for a global company, and I was wondering if you can see any trends that are smart things that other countries are doing for their local businesses that you're pushing global Oh, yeah. That's such a great question. Wow. Uh, <laughs> So in Australia, there's a supermarket chain actually that works with local grocers to, and farmers to create this cooperative. And I think that's really collaborative and smart because they get the best, freshest produce and they basically have like a farmer's market at their super supermarket. And whereas they're a chain and sort of a, a countrywide brand in Australia, I think that's just a smart way to make things you know, national to local. Um, so that's really smart. We see a lot of EV charging in EMEA right now in the European regions. Um, and we're seeing it obviously expanding a lot more in the U.S. too. Um, but we're seeing things with Volkswagen in Germany, for instance. There's something called the Volkswagen Experience where you can basically target someone who owns a Volkswagen with different... Um, different things. So say I'm driving home from work. I, I go into a physical brick and mortar location in Munich, Germany, and I leave and it knows my routine, sort of like Google Maps. If you're, if you're an avid user of Google Maps, like, oh, are you going here? Well, <laughs> how did you know that? It's, it's routine and pattern. So they actually can target in the forecourt fueling area of different like local gas stations, like an Argo, which is BP, over there and say, you know, we have hot, fresh and ready rotisserie chickens for $3, but they can target it through the Volkswagen in car navigation system. And I think that's really smart. Um, they also have like this luxury program in the Netherlands. 
and I I don't know, like I personally wouldn't use this, but you pay a premium and they come and fuel up your vehicle in your driveway so you don't have to go to the pump. I think that was a service out of convenience that was created during COVID so people didn't have to go touch the pump. Um, I'm also seeing, I mean, in EMEA, it's kind of 10 years before our time for the most part and the level of adoption that they have for SEO and SEM. Um, but in LATAM, in Latin America, I'm seeing a lot of uh, growth around uh, offsite SEO and then leveraging TripAdvisor in some really smart ways for, for all businesses. But I think LATAM typically has been underserved uh, as, as a country in general for SEO, SEM. Well, sir, oh, yeah, yes, um, so we talk a lot about hybrid you know, commerce and offline and online, um, multi-touch world, so at many touch points for customer making purchase. What are some analytics platforms that help track all this? Um, so I, I don't want to talk about my own company, but um, we actually pull in Google Insights. Anyone can do this. Pull in Google Insights into one place. Um, and then we also pull in Facebook Insights. Uh, we also tap in direct to the APIs of a lot of the other publishers to pull all of that in in one uniform view. Um, Moz is a great company that does this. They pull everything all into one place and make it really easy and seamless for the user. And then stat analytics too on top of that, are, it's a really powerful choice. Um, I've seen, you know, SEMrush provide that, provide a similar instance as well. So it just depends on the needs of your clients. Um, but there, there are some really talented providers out there. And I think it's the all in one source that makes it really easy for the end user too. Let's give Kelly another round of applause. Thank you.